Today's video was recorded on October 11th, 2022. In today's lesson, we explore the structure of the final 15 chapters of Exodus and look at how the concept of creation or recreation is woven into the narrative itself. We mentioned in our previous lesson that the final chapters of Exodus are written in a chiastic structure. A chiasm, which gets its name from the Greek letter chi, is a method of helping the reader or listener focus their attention to the main idea that the author intends to convey. And tonight we take a closer look at this chiastic structure and what the author of Exodus intends as the turning point or the main idea. Within the structure, we find something very interesting. Creation itself is being revisited. So building the tabernacle is creating a space for the presence of God to dwell with the Israelites. And in this sense, it mimics creation as a dwelling place for God's presence and his people. And as we follow Exodus to its close, we see a motif of renewal, rebirth, or recreation. God and his people are back together, stepping forthrightly into the future together. So we hope you enjoy this lesson on chiastic structure and creation revisited. Okay, so I'm calling this one creation revisited. I think you'll see why when we get to the end, because nestled inside of this giant structure at the end of Exodus, from Exodus 25 to 40, it's like a it's they're recounting creation. It's like it's there's a new creation happening. They're born again after they go through this process. And I think tonight you'll see that. You'll see how it carries a message of rebirth, renewal, a new creation, as if God started over again. And now they're all coming out of that, a nation, but now a nation with God's presence. So creation revisited. It's still in the, there is still the notion of awakening from above and awakening from below. And you'll see that tonight, and we'll do a quick review of that. So it's still nestled inside of that idea. And then this is going to be our 24th in the book of Exodus. What did I do with my clicker? Here we go. Now, the background photo, just so that I make sure I give some credit for it. This is uh, the Providence Lithograph Company from 1907, and what I had to do was I had to back it out. So that's what the whole thing looks like. God coming down on Mount Sinai, the people coming to the base of the mountain to meet God, and so I tried to find something that would represent that, the awakening or the revelation that comes down from above and then the same awakening or revelation that comes up through our participation with God. But it, I couldn't, that doesn't fit the screen too well, so I had to zoom in. But you can still see the cloud on Mount Sinai and the people down below. So that's just what that background picture represents. So creation revisited. I want to start, so if you have your handout, We'll start on number one. This is a little bit of review from last week. So we talked about this idea. Now, the idea comes from the rabbis, um, partly because they're obviously dealing with the Hebrew. They've dealt with Exodus the longest. They read it in Hebrew, and they're looking for all of these things in the text that sometimes as Christians we don't look for. So they have uh, this idea, and then the idea actually matches our own experience with God. So that, yes, God sometimes breaks through nature. He reveals himself in ways to humanity. And we see that. That's the awakening from above. God showing up in ways. Uh, the ten plagues, the, the dividing of the Red Sea. Jesus' miracles, right, is... God breaking through the ordinary, the mundane of, of everyday existence, and people wake up. Now, that's only one half, though, of the idea of redemption, because the other half is the transformation of humanity from below, and that's when we participate with God. 
Sometimes the only way to learn about the nature of God is to participate, to act. You learn about tithing by tithing. You can't just sit and ponder it for a while and try to figure out if it makes sense or not. You do it, and the doing is what transforms you. That's part of the redemption process. So it's when humanity participates with God. It's moving from a, someone who's observing church to someone who's participating in church. If you can remember maybe a point in that in your life where you went from observer to participant, then you might say, oh yes, I do remember this transformation that took place, because that's what happens when we start participating. So that's the awakening from above and below. Now, we talked about the story of Exodus starting out as slaves, and the movement of all the way up until Exodus 25 is the movement from slavery to Mount Sinai. The whole way is God is doing all the work. God sends the ten plagues. God battles Pharaoh. God divides the Red Sea. God shows up on Mount Sinai in fire and smoke. And he even says, Exodus 19, Remember how I carried you on eagles' wings. You didn't do anything. I picked you up and carried you out of Egypt. That's the revelation from above, so that they see God. It uh, the you the emotion. It's awe, and awe is the it's wonder and fear at the same time. The immenseness of God. So you're a little bit afraid, but it's also the wonder of what's happening. So God moves them to Mount Sinai. They enter a covenant relationship. So it's grace that brings them to Mount Sinai. They didn't do anything. We didn't have to work for it. Then God says, hey, would you like to be in a covenant with me? Just like a, a, a wedding, a marriage. And they all say, yes, we'll do it. God says, okay, well, now that we're in a relationship, guess what? You need to start behaving properly. And you get the commandments. And we've we talked for a couple of weeks in a row how those commandments are really centered on the community. How do we structure a community for God's presence to, to dwell? So they say yes to God in essentially a marriage ceremony, and what's the first thing they do? They cheat on him. They build the golden calf. They go right back into their old ways. And the way the rabbis view this is, is that revelation from above, as awesome as it is, has limitations on how it can transform humanity, because they slipped right back into their old ways. And it's only when they then, after the sin of the golden calf, begin to participate. They begin to, uh, they do the work of building the tabernacle. They provide the materials. Moses gives all the direction. And that's where you get the transformation or awakening. It's the revelation. This is how we learn about God through experiential things, not from top down someone just telling it to us. And that has obviously got an incredible transformation power. So this is the story of Exodus, and this is how the rabbis come up with this idea of above and below. Then, what we did last week, and we're going to do more. This is going to be a busy slide that I'm going to put on the screen, but we'll do more of this tonight, is the last 15 chapters of Exodus then provides us a picture within a literary structure called a chiastic structure. And we'll talk about what that means tonight. So it's a chiastic structure. Everything on the top, starting in chapter 25, that's the awakening from above. God comes down on Mount Sinai. You have the, the text, the, uh, the way the chiasm works. It flows to a point that's going to be the turning point. Everything above that middle line, the Lord gives the instructions for the tabernacle. God gives the instructions for the Sabbath. And what do we end up with? Golden calf. And then that golden calf, plus what I'm going to add on to it, is the attributes of God. God revealing himself, his merciful side to Moses. The relationship is restored. And at that point, now the Israelites get to work. 
Everything switches. You do not hear from God yet in the second half. Moses gives the instructions for the Sabbath. Moses gives the instructions for the tabernacle. The Israelites participate in building it. They're now engaged in building the space for God's presence to dwell. And once it's built, now God's presence comes off of the mountain and he's down with his people just like he he wanted it. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, the presence of God with the people of God in the place of God. And that's how Exodus ends with God's presence intensely dwelling in the tabernacle. But it's only after the people participate, and that's what the rabbis call awakening from below or revelation from below. It's revealing, it's us learning about God through doing rather than top down. Okay, so this was all last week, and we'll do more on this chiastic structure in a minute here. Um, I mentioned last week a book that uh, I'll show you a quote from the book, but let me show you a book here. Delightful little book about Jewish spirit, uh, Jewish spirituality. It's actually Jewish spirituality: a brief introduction for Christians, by Rabbi Lawrence Kushner, and very easy read. He does cover this concept, Revelation from Above and Below, in that book. So this is what he says. Here's the quote and what I, what I mentioned last week, having to do with the Revelation from Below, how we learn. So he says, uh, some actions cannot be understood or heard, because that's what the Bible uses the word Shema to hear, until they're performed or done. So. Very often, there are concepts that we simply cannot understand. God gives a commandment that we're just not sure. I don't understand that. Why do I have to do that? Blah, 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 blah. We can't hear it. We don't hear it well enough. And he says, some things you can't hear or understand until you do them, you perform them. And so by doing, we understand. And I think, honestly, so much of life is this way. He goes on to say, In this way, performing a commandment, even if you don't understand why, it changes you. It brings you closer to God. In fact, the Aramaic word for commandment, Aramaic, it has the idea of connection. So we think the word commandment is like, wah, wah. Like, we don't like the word commandment or law. But what if it was connection? What if it was your way of connecting to God? If you viewed it through that light, you might say, whoa, yeah, let me recite the Shema in the morning when I wake up and before I go to bed, as it says in Deuteronomy 6. It's my way to connect with God first thing in the morning and last thing at night as I declare my allegiance to the one and only God. I don't know. There's probably nothing wrong with that. And it's, I'm not saying to be legalistic about it, but there's connecting points through us with the commandments. So, and then by connecting, it changes you. And that's what the whole thing. It's the transformation from below and it brings you closer to God. And of course, that's what we see in Exodus. As they, as they build the tabernacle, God comes down and dwells with them. Okay. So that was all last week. That was revelation uh, from above and below. So let me, I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears now and talk just a little bit about the idea of a chiastic structure. Some of you may know what that is, but let's let's go through it to make sure that we have a good understanding of it. And chiastic structure is a literary device. It gives the the text, authors use it to give the text structure. It helps focus the reader or the listener to the point of the main idea of what you're talking about that's being presented. And it's found in literature from around the ancient Near East. It's everywhere in the Bible, both Old Testament and New. So this is a very common way of structuring the text. In fact, a great one, if, you, if at some point you want to go look it up, is the Tower of Babel. It's a great chiastic structure 
Uh, we've got a video on that one too. We did that lesson many years ago. Um, so it looks like this. It's based off of the Greek letter chi, and the Greek letter chi is an X. And then what they do is if you take away two aspects of the X, you end up with a little arrow. And that's going to be what the text looks like as it's uh, written out. And then if we go closer to this, what ends up happening is, say, verse 1a at, at the top, so verse 1a at the top will end up looking similar to verse 1b at the bottom. So in this, in our Exodus case, God's presence on Mount Sinai, so it's all about the presence of God, and then a 1b at the bottom, God's presence in the tabernacle. So they're connected. Then you go inward, 2a, 2b. These are connected. At some point, you're going to get a transition. You're going to turn. So in, uh, sometimes the turn has one verse. Sometimes it has two. So ours today has two. So I'll put 3a and 3b. And as the structure of the text flows outward to this culminating point, this becomes where you have the main idea. It focuses the attention to the importance, and we'll see today, it's the golden calf followed by the God's divine attributes, including forgiveness and restoration of the people. And then from that point on, now it flows back outwards and you get the presence of God dwelling with the people. So this is the basic chiastic structure. There are variances here and there, but... Uh, you get the point, and I'll sh when you look at the one on the back of your handout, it looks exactly like this. So, now, just for the video, and this is not anything you need to know, but I want people who would watch this later to at least understand if they want to go uh, research it more. Chi is Greek. So, chi for chiastic is Greek. What do we call it in Hebrew? Well, in Hebrew, they refer to it as at bosh. It's an at bosh structure. Well, what? on earth is an at bosh. Well, it has to do with the letters of, a, of the Hebrew alphabet. So if we go back to our little arrow here, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. The last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Tav. Aleph, Tav, At. So Jesus in Greek is the Aleph and the Omega. In Hebrew, he's the Aleph, oh, he's the Alpha and the Omega. In Hebrew, he's the Aleph and the Tav, the whole package. So you have Aleph and Tav, that's the At. Then the next, the second letter in the alphabet is a Bet. And the second to last one is a Shin. So you have At Bosh, and that's just the, how, the, how if you're talking to a Jewish friend, you might, they know what a chiasm is anyways, they study chiastic structures as it is, but in Hebrew, at bosh. That's the way they refer to it. Okay, so if you look at the back of your handout, page two, I added some things from last week. I had a very, I had a rudimentary chiastic structure last week, and I expanded it with some more information. Didn't want to overwhelm you last week with it. So I'm going to put the whole thing up here on the screen. It's going to look really small, so I'm going to walk through it different. But you have it on the back of your sheet. And you can see how that it has an arrow-like structure. There's going to be a turning point in the middle, and everything's going to match, okay? Everything is going to match from chapter uh, 25 to, to about 32, and then Exodus 34 out to chapter 40. Okay, so if you look on the back of your handout, which is just, just the chiastic structure, I'll review from what we did last week. It starts with God's presence on Mount Sinai, and in the case up there, Moses is actually able to enter the presence of God, which is a little bit strange, but he enters the presence of God on the mountain. So it's on the mountain, but apparently diffuse enough that, that Moses can enter. So he enters. Then we find tabernacle instructions. The whole time in, these, in this beginning part, the tabernacle instructions, it's only God talking. The Lord said. Then you get a section on 
Bezalel and Aholibab say those ten times fast? Uh, Bezalel and Aholibab. The reason that's important is, one, it's going to get repeated. Moses is going to talk about it. But this is the first time in the Bible we find God saying, I'm going to put my spirit on you. The spirit of God will rest on them and they will have wisdom and knowledge, uh, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And you get this trifecta of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge that is all throughout the Bible. So the, those two are the artisans. Okay, then God is going to give commandments for the Sabbath. Okay? Then, and this is one I added this week, the tablets, the Ten Commandments, are inscribed by the finger of God. Moses comes down off the mountain. He finds the golden calf. What happens to the tablets? Broken. I mean, this would be the holiest thing ever, is to have the, the, the tablets inscribed by God, and they end up shattered. But you can see here, we're flowing down to the golden calf incident, and then, right on the other side, the turning point, are the divine attributes. We'll, we'll cover those in the weeks to come. But here's the turning point. And from this point forward, the whole thing flips, it inverts. So if we invert this, you have the golden calf incident, you have the divine attributes of Exodus 34, that's your turning point. Even after all of what God did, they still sin, just like we do. We go off the path. God's mercy brings us back in, and they get back on the path. So you have those two incidents. That's the turning point. Very next thing that happens, God says, Moses, now you inscribe the tablets. And Rabbi Jonathan Sachs points out, the holy relic should have been the ones that God inscribed. Those should have been the ones that lasted eternal. But they didn't. And that's part of the lesson. When Moses then participates, he gets the tablets, he writes down the, the Word of God. Those are the ones that end up lasting throughout Israel's history in the, in the Ark of the Covenant. So it's the, um, that's actually part of the lesson, that Moses inscribes the tablets. Then Moses gives Sabbath instructions. Then you have the repeat of uh, Bezalel and Aholibab. Then you have tabernacle instructions, but this time it's Moses giving them and the people doing. That's the transformation that's happening. And eventually God's presence is in the tabernacle. And this time the intensity of God's presence in, with the people in the tabernacle is so intense that, God, that Moses cannot enter. Too intense. So this, that's the second half, right? And if we go back out, now you get that whole amazing structure. And you can see how these line up. God's presence to God's presence. Tabernacle instructions to tabernacle. Tablets inscribed by God to tablets inscribed by Moses. And that's where this idea, the awakening from above, right? When we see God revealed and the awakening from below, that's us now participating. That's the full, the fullness of redemption comes when we don't just sit on the couch, you know, naps, nachos, and Netflix and wait for the second coming. You know, you, you, after you're saved, you get up. And you start building the kingdom of God, and you're transformed even more through that. Uh, you know, the thing is, though, as you can see, this is an ancient text, and it's narrative. So um, they use these, these techniques to help highlight the, the ideas emerge out of the text, rather than being top-down, just told where to, where to find it. And I think, you know, you can see we have a spiritual concept of redemption, right? God created us that we have to participate in the process. And what's so great about this, you know, so what it is, is in order to fully understand, in order to fully grasp the transformational power of redemption, we're part of that process. And I think as parents, 
We can all see this. God is our parent, and he looks at his kids and he says, look, at some point I got to stop doing all the stuff. The child has to pick up, on their own, pick up their own load, begin to act on their own, and that's when the child becomes a person, right? It's, it's the process of transforming into a person, right? A, a parent who thinks they're doing the kid a favor by doing everything for them in life is actually hindering the child, right? It's the child atrophies. They don't strengthen. And at worst, they become, you know, a spoiled brat who doesn't know how to get on in life. And so it's so cool to have this a spiritual concept like, uh, like redemption that is built into the literary structure. It gives you the picture of how humanity is supposed to become fully awake. So very powerful tool to uh, focus our attention on what the main idea is. Okay, now, nestled inside of this whole thing, as I mentioned at the top, is something that has to do with creation itself. Because God's, re he's in a sense, recreating. They're born again, in a way. So we're going to revisit what's happening at creation. And again, it's structured into the biblical text. So we have to be so familiar with the text that it starts to pop out at you. That you, when you see repetition in the Bible, look for the chiastic structure because it's often there. Okay, in this case, what we find in the, in the Bible, if you want, do me a favor. If you have your Bible in front of you, turn to chap Exodus 30. Because if you have Exodus 30 open, you'll start seeing where a whole bunch of these are in Exodus 30. Okay, God is going to give instructions for the tabernacle. And remember, the tabernacle is creating a space for God's presence, just like at creation. So the tabernacle is going to be something for God to dwell with his people, the space. So, in the instructions, starting at Exodus 25, Verse 1, seven times, seven times, right? Anytime you see seven, you pay attention. Seven times the phrase, the Lord said to Moses, is repeated, and only seven times. The reason I say only is because as the instructions of the tabernacle, he could have easily put the phrase in more, but it's not. Seven times, which means pay attention. And what's happening here? So. Uh, Exodus 25, 1, and the Lord said to Moses, that kicks everything off. Then in Exodus 30, you get a whole bunch of them. The Lord said to Moses, Exodus 30, 11. Exodus 30, 17, the Lord said to Moses. Uh, verse 22 in chapter 30, the Lord said to Moses. Now you get the point, right? You can see the repetition. Verse 34, the Lord said to Moses. Then you get to Exodus 31, 1, the Lord said to Moses. They're all clustered together. Just like Genesis, how does God create the world? By speaking. And God speaks into existence the place where he's going to dwell with his people. So seven times this is spoken. And oh, by the way, Exodus 31, uh, verse 12, the seventh time is instructions for the Sabbath. So just like seven days at the, in, in uh, creation, God's recreating. It's, it's a glaring repetition of uh, Genesis, especially because it ends with the Sabbath. But what happens in Genesis? God creates the space. How long does it take for, he, for humanity to ruin, our ancestor Adam and Eve, to ruin everything, to send it all back into chaos? It doesn't take but a day. Right? So Genesis, sin comes in. What happens when God does this, when God creates the tabernacle? Very first thing, golden calf. And God is not happy. He comes back to Moses. He says, I ought to destroy you people. I'm going, you're on your own from now on. Moses has to calm God down. They have a discussion. They bring, it gets back into the covenant. But you get the point. It's the same things repeating. Now, what's cool then is what's going to happen on the other side? right? The other side of the chiasm. Well, 
When you get to the other side, now it's Moses speaking. And Moses said, and then uh, chapter 35, 4, and Moses said, and then again, and Moses said. Now, here's something that's cool about this, though. They only have three times where Moses said. It gets your mind going. You already know. You saw the first seven, so you know what Moses is up to. It's, it's creation all over again. Moses says three times. And the reason I want to point this out is there's a book in our New Testament that does something similar, the Gospel of John. So he, right here, they get you started down the path. That's what John does. Jesus does seven signs in the book of John. The first sign, and John writes, this was the first sign. Then he does another one. This was the second sign. And then from that point on, he's like, okay, you're on your own. You count the signs. And of course, the sixth one in John is raising of Lazarus, just like on the sixth day, God raised a human being. So does, it happens again. It's creation all over again, just like the beginning of John's gospel in the beginning, like that one just tells us what he's doing. So you get something similar in the gospel of John where he doesn't have Moses say it seven times. But what happens at the end when they've built the tabernacle, the last thing where you find and Moses says is Exodus 39, 43. We're going to turn there in a minute. But the text says that Moses saw their work and he blessed them. What does that sound like? Genesis 1. It's the same Hebrew word that comes from Genesis 1. So do me a favor. Let's look at this one because I want to, then I want to go right to chapter 40, this idea of creation all over again. So look at um, Exodus 39, 42 and 43. So Exodus 39, 42 and 43, this is the Israelites doing all the work. So it says, the Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses inspected the work. He saw that they had done it just as the Lord commanded. So Moses blessed them. And it's that right there. Same verb as in Genesis 1. And it's the only time in the book of Exodus where you find that verb blessing, that somebody blesses them. And oh, by the way, in the book of Exodus, God does not bless them. So the verb only shows up one time, and it's Moses doing it, just like the priests, right? God wants a kingdom of priests. It's the priests who bless on behalf of God, and it's us who bless those when we see God, God's create or God's will at work. We participate in that as well. So it's not a coincidence that that idea of Moses blessing them. Okay, but let's turn the page. Turn, well, you, don't, you might not have to turn the page in your Bible, but look at Exodus 40, verse 1. What's the very next thing that happens? It's a new beginning. So Exodus 40, verse 1, is now God's going to say, Okay, Moses, now that you've gone through this, you've seen it, you blessed them. And then it starts out, The Lord said to Moses, Set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, on the first day of the first month. What do we call the first day of the first month of the year? New Year's Day. Now, first day, first month. If you recall, back in Exodus, uh, back in Exodus, back in Exodus 12, the Passover event, God starts a calendar. He's, Exodus 12 starts out, this shall be for you the first month of the year. That's the springtime. So a whole year has gone by, and God says, okay, Moses, we're starting over. It's a new year, first day of the first month. Okay? Exodus 40, verse 1. Now look down in your Bible at verse 17, because this is going to be a little bit more explicit. Verse 17, Exodus 40, verse 17. So the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the month in the second year. It's a, a new year. There's a renewal. It's 
Out with the old, in with the new, Father time is dying, baby new year is here. Right? The sins of our past have been forgiven, and now we are in a new year. It's a, it's a new creation. We're born again, right? It's a fresh start with God. And so it's a great picture at the end of Exodus as God's now going to march into the future uh, with, the, with the Israelites. And then finally, let's go down to the very end, Exodus 40, 34, and 35. And this is where, once Moses sets up that tabernacle, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent, because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Repeated twice that phrase. So here's where Moses couldn't enter. And the glory of the Lord. It's God's presence dwelling in that sacred space with his people. That's the full picture of redemption. Now, we're not there yet. We're in the process of being redeemed, right? God redeemed or saved us from our sinful past. But God is in the process of still redeeming us or saving us because we're not perfect. We still fail and we get back up and we confess and say, God, I, I've, I, sometimes we don't even know that we're doing it. It's unintentional sin. So God's, uh, he saves us from our sinful past, but then he redeems us in the present moment as we transform spiritually so that one day the full consummation of redemption, that's what you see in Revelation where the new heaven and the new earth come down and God's presence dwells with his people. That's when we're fully redeemed, is the ultimate redemption in the end. So redemption really is like three sections to redemption or salvation. And of course, that's how Exodus ends, which is really just an amazing picture. Okay, so a couple things. Here's what we did tonight, just as a review. The first thing is we have to know that chiastic structure. These chiastic structures are all over the ancient Near East. They're everywhere in the Bible, and they help to provide depth to the narrative. The story is just not, it's not randomly told. It's told or conveyed to us with a purpose. The structure helps pull the meaning out of the text, uh, focus our attention. So it's important for us to know about chiastic structure because everybody in the ancient world knew about it, and we need to do the work to appreciate this amazing document that's come to us that sometimes is hard to figure out and hard to decipher. So we have to go step by step um, to see these, these things come out of the text. And, you know, often these, our New Testament writers, they don't go back and try to reiterate every single thing in the Old Testament. They assume you know it. They assume you understand the, the context and the references they're making. They know it, and they assume their audience does too. So we have to start with chiastic structure. Then we can, we can overlay then those last 15 chapters of Exodus and see how they have the awakening from above with God working on, on above, the awakening from below with the people uh, participating in that, and the transformation that takes place through doing. And then, of course, it's all about Creation revisited, creating that space for God, his people, and the presence of God to dwell. And again, woven into the text, so we have to pay close attention to these little things that point us back to Genesis, and we see what's happening. And of course, with the whole goal in mind, right? God wants to dwell right now with his people. So we have to structure our church, our society, our own lives, we have to create space for God. He'll fill that space. And when we do that, then the presence of God, or God dwells more powerfully right now, just like Jesus' prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's us building the kingdom uh, with Jesus as our Lord right here and now. Yes, we'll, it'll be consummated in the future, but these are our duties right now to uh, participate in it.